Joe Rogan is out with a new scathing take on former President Donald Trump's legal troubles. He said it was worth between 300 and 700 million dollars. And uh, they were saying that it's worth 18 million. <laughs> <laughs> It's like they don't even try to pretend. Yeah. Like why, if, why does no one the trust guy, the mainstream? If the guy says his house is worth a billion dollars, right? Yeah. And then you come along and say, no, 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 it's worth like eight hundred million. Forbes says it's worth as much as seven hundred million. We're, we'll call it seven hundred million. Now you got a reasonable argument. Yeah. yeah. But if you say eighteen million, like you got to know that's a, a palace. <laughs> the place is a palace. It's twenty acres. Get the f out of here. This is great. You can't do that. That's like too obvious. You're just, you don't give a f about the truth. This morning, New York Attorney General Letitia James went on the offensive using Twitter to make her case against the former president with an infographic detailing his alleged financial fraud. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Trump world, the former president has dropped his $500 million lawsuit against former attorney Michael Cohen. According to reporting in The Hill, Trump has been delaying sitting for a deposition in the case. So that, I guess, explains why he's been delaying it if he's not serious about pursuing it. Um, look, this has been kind of a mess from the start, and I feel like a lot of people, now that we've moved on from the 2016 presidential primaries on the Republican side, have maybe forgotten the difference between taking Trump seriously and literally. Uh, whether or not you know he's really asserting that his home is worth, his properties are worth this much money as a serious thing that he's saying or a literal thing, I think might be missing the point that he's always been prone to exaggeration, right? And that's sort of his speaking style. He's this big, braggadocious New Yorker. He's a businessman. They always do things like this. This. But obviously, normally that doesn't run up against a court of law and official, you know, valuations on his home and his properties. Uh, and it seems like, you know, that it, his style does not necessarily meld well with a courtroom. And I still, most of the photos I've seen where Trump is sitting in the courtroom for this trial in New York, it looks like something AI would generate because it's just so strange to see him sitting and being unable to react or respond. Uh, what has been your take? Have you been following this? And what do you think? Where do you think this is going? Yeah, I think the whole Trump trials are hilarious. I would love to see Trump sit in a deposition for his own attorney's lawsuit. He is suing his attorney, and in that deposition, Trump would have to plead the fifth. It would be hilarious. They would just simply be asking him what he tasked his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to do. Very easy, theoretically, uh, questions to answer. But not for Donald Trump, not for someone like him, who very clearly we, we heard in the depositions with the, the fraud case trial, uh, Cohen was very aware of the fraud that was going on. This deposition would be so easy. He's honestly smart for not sitting down for it. Uh, a lot of the depositions for this case were quite funny. I think we'll get into them later in the show. But to have Donald Trump not be willing to sit for the own his own lawsuit's deposition tells you just how much fraud he's been committing. And so I think it's kind of hilarious. I do agree with you that it's funny to watch him sit there silently, unable to react in a court of law. And this is something that they wanted cameras on them when they were in the courtroom. And I don't think it's playing to their benefit at all. Yeah, no, it, it's been very interesting how, how much effort has been put in by those going after Trump to make sure theoretically that they could, you know, either humiliate him as much as possible or make sure that they were seen as going after him as much as possible. But as we've seen with each progressing indictment against him, his poll numbers have gotten better in the Republican primary for 2024, so much so that Trump has repeatedly asked to be indicted a fifth time or a sixth time or how many other times people can find to bring cases against him. And so it, it, it's been interesting to see how televised this is. Obviously, in this New York case, you have sort of this goofy video that's become memed around the internet with uh, TV show theme songs put over it, of the judge in the courtroom just kind of smiling and shrugging. You've got, obviously, the Attorney General, Letitia James, in the courtroom just sort of glaring, burning a hole in his back with her eyes. You've got Trump sitting there. It really is just a very strange thing to see, and it, it sort of gives us a preview in this New York case of what things are going to look like in the Georgia case in Fulton County, because obviously that is also a place where cameras will be allowed and is different from the federal cases, the case being brought against him here in D.C. over January 6th and the case down in Florida uh, over the classified documents being kept at Mar-a-Lago. And so it is interesting to see how this is going to play out. And again, I think Donald Trump, as this man who really you know rose to prominence and has the name ID that he did before being president, thanks to his work on TV shows like The Apprentice, Celebrity Apprentice, interesting to see that he can still, even when he's not in control, sort of compel an audience or draw an audience to see what he's doing and have so many people still talking about him and what he's doing. Uh, do you think that there is a downside?
side to all of this, you know, being televised. Obviously, with the polls, it doesn't seem like it. You know, he went to Fulton County and has mugshot taken in Georgia, and is now selling all this merch with his mugshot on it. It seems like him being in a courtroom and sitting in the defendant's position is not actually having any harm on his polling numbers or his chances at 2024. Yeah, I think we have to take this case by case. In the fraud case, it's kind of humorous to think that he simply inflated the the valuation or the value of his assets for the purpose of seeming like he's more rich than he is. That's not something that necessarily hurts anyone. And I think when someone considers Donald Trump being indicted and not determining whether or not they vote for someone, it's like, are they a good person? We already knew Trump was the kind of guy that wanted to seem like the wealthiest, most powerful dude. This doesn't change a lot of people's opinions of Donald Trump. And so I can see why the argument is made that this is something that is petty. I would much rather have seen a lawsuit brought before Donald Trump about unpaid wages, unpaid contracts to a lot of the construction workers that have worked on his properties. That maybe have made a difference. That is something that directly injured other people. And so I think things might go a little bit differently in Fulton County, Georgia, where we have, you know, some evidence come out showing his communication regarding the election in 2020. I think the case might look a little bit different in D.C. We've already had the public, the court of public opinion have their hearing on January 6th in Congress. Uh, but the also the case in Florida, I don't see having as much of an impact either. A lot of people have made up their mind as to how they feel about Trump hoarding these supposedly still classified documents. It seems he admitted they were still classified himself. Not much to litigate there. So I think people made their minds up about that. I really think the crux of this whole thing is Fulton County, Georgia, because it concerns an election. A lot of people that support Donald Trump genuinely believed that it was stolen. Many of them still do. So if it comes out that Trump didn't believe that and was still fighting to win in 2020, I could see that changing some folks' views of him. Yeah, I think uh, the Georgia case especially will be interesting because of how many co-defendants there are and how it's sort of this cast of people who are around Trump for so many years, both leading up to during the 2020 election and then afterwards. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see. You know, We've had some of the defendants in that case trying to sort of split up their case from the larger group of people. Obviously, the attorney or the district attorney down there, Fonnie Willis, is trying to rush this through as quickly as possible. But it just seems like that has not really been happening. And I'm, it's interesting to think about the timeline because I know we've talked about it before, but how all of these trials and the start dates and different things that the pres former president is going to have to do so closely align with the 2024 Republican primary schedule starting you know, early next year when you have the Iowa caucuses and then moving on to the other early states followed by Super Tuesday and how he's going to have to sort of pick and choose where he goes because he has to be in the courtroom for some of these events, but not all of them. And so I, I, I do think you're right that watching this is making it a very different situation. But I think sort of the pundits who have said, oh, well, Donald Trump will not be able to run for president because he's going to have to be in a courtroom. I don't think he loses out on anything because instead of being talked about as one member of the field of candidates running in these states, it's just all talking only about him. And again, leads lends more credibility to his case that this is just like the Russia hoax. This is like the impeachments over the perfect phone call, things like that. It seems like everything, even though these people are trying to take Trump take Trump down and make him basically unpalatable to the American electorate, have only done the opposite and made him more of a hero to them, uh, like you said. And if they can't prove in Georgia that he knew that the election wasn't stolen, I don't know what happens then. I mean, I, it seems like those people who have been going after Trump will be just as responsible for his election potentially in 2024 as the same people who are saying he couldn't do it were responsible in 2016. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think as far as the, the campaigning goes and the folks saying Trump is distracted from his presidential campaign because he's at trial, I can honestly see this having absolutely no effect on the outcome of the election simply because Biden has to spend a similar amount of time out of the field because he's literally serving as president. Kind of difficult to do both at once to be stumping all across America and also uh, being the commander in chief. I can see a world where Biden plays that to his advantage. Okay, he's busy in court. Well, I am the president of the United States. Why don't I make good on some of the policy promises I made that got people to vote for me? Uh, president Biden didn't really have to run a presidential campaign because we had the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. He didn't have to stump constantly all across the United States. Now he can do that, but I think he would better use his time. 
if he actually worked towards student loan debt cancellation, which a lot of the folks that voted for him who were young, many uh, analysts found that the youth vote determined the election result for Biden in many states. And if young people didn't turn out in numbers that they hadn't before, Biden would have lost in key states. Why do you think young people were turning out more than ever? Because young people are more progressive than ever and Joe Biden ran as a progressive that included a promise to cancel student loan debt. And so he really botched the campaign promise there. The Bidenomics message that he has of working on economic progress from the ground up just doesn't match the current policy of raising interest rates, injecting a large amount of money into the economy to the tune of about $1.2 trillion uh, in interest paid to those who could afford to purchase bonds and make investments in a time of high interest rates. It's essentially saying in order to get inflation down, we're going to have to hand a ton of money to the wealthiest people in our country with extra money, so much so they can let it sit for a while and turn into more money. All the while, they're making more people unemployed, and that's their promise. He's going to have to change how he's governing, I think, if he really wants to win in 2024. He's going to need to make good on those promises. So. The way things stand right now, if Biden doesn't do that, if he doesn't wake up, I don't think Trump's campaign is hurt at at all by him being in in court because Biden's going to have to be in the Oval Office and White House. Yeah, I think that's true. And your point about uh, sort of the promises of Joe Biden not matching where we're at, you know, three years into this, it's definitely well put. We just uh, there was a poll recently that showed that Republicans have the largest advantage over Democrats on keeping America prosperous since 1991. Obviously, this week we have President Biden all of a sudden announcing uh, that border wall will be constructed in Texas, something we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, and it does seem like he's really struggling to pr- deliver on the Build Back Better Bidenomics, whatever policies uh, he called them. Uh, and we will have more on those topics with more rising right after this.